This video is sponsored by Brilliant. Let me begin by saying that I love my cats dearly, but they're not exactly the sharpest tools in the shed. Sometimes Ralph and Bella do things so bafflingly dumb or bizarre that I can't help but question what, if anything, is going on inside their fluffy little heads. But there is one way to find out, an IQ test. So Ralph, complete each following analogy by underlining two words from those in parentheses. I don't think Ralph was taking it very seriously. Clearly a human IQ test wasn't going to work, so I'd have to devise a feline one. I read a ton of books on the subject, and countless websites and online quizzes, but they were mostly pseudoscientific nonsense. They did, however, all have questions and methods in common, so I pressed them all together and squeezed out the good bits to form my own. I call it the Seriously Unscientific and Borderline Silly Cat Reasoning, Intelligence and Behaviour Exam. Huh, would you look at that? I guess it's the universe's way of asking you to please consider subscribing. Question 1. Play a video of birds on the TV. Does your cat 1. Never realise it's just a video and try to catch the birds? 2. Take a bit of time but eventually realise? Or for 3 points, quickly realise they can't actually get the birds? I filmed birds from my own garden and played them on the TV for Ralph first. Straight away he was interested, following as they darted around the screen and standing on his hind legs to get a closer look. He did this for a good few minutes, although I think he was being overly cautious of these gigantic larger-than-life birds, so I made the screen smaller. Then he really got interested. This went on for roughly 15 minutes, constantly swatting the screen and trying to catch those delicious birds. Soon Bella joined in. She was also incredibly interested, and whilst Ralph went to look for the birds behind the TV, Bella kept watch from the front. At no point did either cat give up or realise they couldn't catch them, so both cats score bottom marks for this round. Question 2. Place a mirror in front of your cat. Does your cat 1. Try to fight their reflection? 2. Show interest but soon realise it's a reflection? Or 3. Immediately know it's a reflection and show disinterest? I put the mirror in front of Ralph and he was more concerned about this massive object several times his size that suddenly appeared. He didn't seem at all phased by his reflection, so he scores his first 3 out of 3. Bella was very much the same. She could clearly recognise that her reflection wasn't another cat and stayed put, even more unfazed than Ralph. Full marks. Question 3. Place some string on your cat's back. Do they 1. Do nothing, 2. Ripple their fur, or 3. Somehow remove the string? I showed Ralph the string before putting it on his back. He did nothing. So then I put it on his head, and he didn't seem to care about that either. He even fell asleep. Bella also didn't seem to care. So I tried the string on her head. She obviously thought she looked very stylish because once again, she made no attempt to remove it. Bottom marks for intelligence, but top marks for fashion. Question 4. Show your cat their favourite toy and then hide it. Do they 1. Never find it, 2. Find it in under 30 seconds, or 3. Find it in under 15 seconds? Bella's a very playful cat, so she insisted on going first this time. After we got her warmed up, Danielle hid the toy behind a giant Lego brick and Bella found it within seconds. Ralph's favourite toy is a catnip-filled pillow, very kindly sent to him by Ari from Maryland. Thanks again, Ari. I let him have a good play with it first, or you know, maybe I just wasn't brave enough to take it from those murderously fluffy paws. How can something be so fluffy and yet so dangerous at the same time? Once he was ready, I hid it behind the brick. And just like Bella, he found it within seconds. Full marks all round. This first section has been very hit and miss, with bottom marks, full marks, bottom marks and full marks again. The next questions, however, are all observations about their behaviour, so hopefully they give us a little more insight. Question 5. Does your cat wake up at the same time slash have a similar morning routine? Both cats wake up like clockwork, and meow relentlessly until we wake up too. We feed them both, and then Bella steals my spot in bed whilst Ralph stays awake until precisely 11am. So yeah, they both have very rigid routines. I'm going to award both cats 5 out of 5. A common theme I found in all the studies and books was that having a predictable and set routine is a high indication of intelligence in a cat. So maybe they're actually super geniuses, or maybe they're just hungry in the mornings. 
Question 6. Does your cat go to bed at the same time slash have a similar evening routine? Bella's bedtime isn't so much driven by a specific time, rather by when we go to bed, but I think we can count that. She first sits on this fluffy red jumper she likes, kneading and purring for about 5 or 10 minutes, it's really sweet. Once she's done, she walks around to her pillow and goes to sleep, so once again, full marks. Ralph, however, basically has no routine whatsoever. He could sleep in any number of places and at any time at all, so he scores a lowly one point. Question 7. Does your cat like a variety of different foods? Bella is exceptionally fussy. She'll only eat one particular brand of cat food, and we even have to alternate between gravy and jelly or she'll refuse to eat it. She's incredibly picky with treats too, so she scores one. Ralph used to only eat his particular gourmet brand, but now loves sharing Bella's half-eaten leftovers. He'll eat almost any treats though, so he scores slightly better at two or three, I'm gonna say two. Question eight. How does your cat communicate they want feeding? The choices for this one are one, they don't, two, sit by their bowl, three, meow relentlessly, four, lead you to the bowl, or five, answers two, three, and four. Both cats undoubtedly score a five. They are incredibly proficient at getting us to feed them. They meow their heads off, sulk sadly beside their bowl, and lead us to their bowls. Now the next five questions are this time on a scale of one to three. Question nine, does your cat make different sounds for different needs? Ralph has a few different meows. He purrs a lot and he makes these weird squeaky noises pretty much all the time. See? Bella purrs and occasionally meows, but that's more or less it, so I'll give them both a two. Question 10. How many words does your cat recognise? Ralph knows his name, Din Dins and Dreamies, which is embarrassingly few. Bella similarly knows her name as well as breakfast. I'd say they understand the intonation in our voices more, but only a couple of actual words, which gives them both the bottom score. Question 11. When stroking your cat, do they move to encourage you to stroke certain spots? Finally a question written for my cats. I mean technically I wrote all of these questions for my cats, but they really excel at this one. Both Ralph and Bella cannot sit still when being stroked. Ralph constantly directs you to above his tail or his cheeks or his head, whilst Bella always steers you towards her chin, and particularly while she's been wearing her donut, her neck. An easy 3 out of 3. Question 12. Can you teach your cat tricks? Nope. Nope, 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 not at all. I tried to make a video about it once, but it didn't go well. A great big fat no. And question 13? If yes, no. Nope, nope, nope. The final question is worth a gigantic 10 points. You know your cat best. On a scale of 1 to 10, how intelligent are they? I'm going to be brutally honest here and give Ralph a 4. I love him dearly, but he's not the brightest spark, especially compared to my previous cats Reggie and Tom, who were both really quite intelligent. Bella gets a 6. Still not exactly Einstein, but undeniably smarter than Ralph. Sorry buddy. And with that, it's time to add up all the scores. Ralph scored a grand total of 33 out of 57, whilst Bella scored 38, putting them both comfortably in the average category. I've linked the test in the description if you want to try this on your cat, so comment how they scored. Are they a feline parodigy or do they have a head full of fluff? Before I wrap this up, it's important to bear in mind that intelligence isn't really what defines a good cat. I want my cats to be friendly, happy, affectionate, playful and fun, and Ralph and Bella certainly have all those traits covered. They're endlessly entertaining, and I'd rather they be a little dopey than be plotting world domination. Now if you want to get smarter, the sponsor of today's video Brilliant is here to help. Brilliant is a problem solving website and app that uses interactive lessons to teach you math, science, computer science and more. Their courses include finance, mathematical fundamentals, machine learning, programming, cryptocurrencies and logic to name just a few. After quizzing my cats all day, I thought I could brush up on logic and reasoning myself. What made the course so wonderful is that you don't just memorise things and obtain surface level knowledge, rather you get a deeper and more thorough understanding of each concept, enabling you to really apply what you've learnt and tackle increasingly challenging problems with ease. It's a shame they don't offer courses for cats. Go to brilliant.org forward slash half asleep Chris to sign up for free, and the first 200 people will get 20% off their annual premium membership. How brilliant is that? Ralph and Tom, they're my favourite little pussy cats. Bella too, she's my favourite loaf of bread. 
It started back with Reggie and his Golden Gate Bridge. Subscribe for all the wonderful adventures ahead. Last week, I built Ralph and Bella a gigantic cat castle, the size of my living room. I made it with these super cool cardboard bricks that slot together, essentially cardboard Lego. But unfortunately, the castle couldn't stay up forever. I kept the banners and put them up on the wall, and even built Ralph a smaller fort that can stay. But now I'm left with 760 cardboard bricks, and a once again spacious and open living room. Well, not for long. My sincere apologies to Danielle, who really wanted the living room back. I want to build a cat maze. In fact, three cat mazes in three difficulty levels. The first will be incredibly basic just to get the cats used to it, right up to the final boss maze which will be as large as a room will allow, with long corridors and several dead ends and false turns. And then we'd pit the cats against one another, in a brutal fight to the death, I mean finish line. Now I'm gonna say something which you might think is me just being mean, but you'll learn for yourself over the course of this video. Ralph and Bella aren't very bright. I mean I love them completely, but they're not exactly the smartest cats in the world. So as I got to work building the first maze, I wanted to keep it painfully simple, so hopefully they wouldn't be able to embarrass themselves too much. Once again, I just want to reiterate, I love my cats, and I really do apologise if this video just ends up being me roasting them for 10 minutes straight. One very blurry time lapse later, and the first maze was finished. So here it is, maze number one. Very simply, the cats enter at the back and follow it round the corner, then have a single decision, right to a dead end or left to the finish line. Simple, right? Oh, and let's go over the rules. Anything goes except leaving the maze. You'll notice that it's not very tall because I still want to be able to film over the top, but it means the cats can easily jump over the walls. If they jump over the internal walls, we'll just call it a creative strategy, but if they jump the external walls and leave the maze, they'll be disqualified from the round. And to clarify, the finish line counts as a bowl of treats at the end. Bella, these are for after you finish the maze. So with all that said, it was time for our first contestant. Ralph has been taking this whole thing very seriously. He's even been studying for the last few days, tweaking his strategy and making sure he's as ready as can be. But will it be enough to beat Bella? And he's off to an incredibly promising start, ignoring the dead end and heading straight towards the finish line with certainty. But what's this? I don't believe my eyes. He's bottled it. The pressure's all got too much for his fluffy little head and he sat down, just centimetres from the finish line. In all my seconds commentating cat mazes, I've never seen anything quite like this. This really is one for the history books. And he waited, and he waited, and he waited, before finally making a sprint finish and enjoying his feast in a time of 45 seconds. Well, that was certainly something. Let's see if Bella can do better. Rather than studying, Bella's been taking a different approach to preparation, instead trying to make sure she's as rested as possible for the big day, and sleeping even more than usual. And who knows, Ralph started out strong but got tired, so maybe all that extra sleep will give Bella the advantage. Our second contestant has just entered the arena, and after a brief head shake makes her way to the first and only junction. And she can't seem to make up her mind. One way leads to eternal doom and the other eternal victory. And it's clearly a thought that's weighing heavily on Bella who's still struggling to decide. Bella's technique was clearly a very thought out one and she eventually made her way to the exit to enjoy her treats. So let's take a look at the scoreboard. Bella emerges victorious in a stunning time of 35 seconds. I guess slow and steady really does win the race. But with two rounds to go, it's still all to play for. So Maze 2 is all finished. Maze 2 now sees two dead ends, this first short one, and this other deceptively long corridor with a dead end around the corner. The correct path is still fairly simple, straight down the middle, but will the two false paths be enough to catch either cat out? Contestant 1 enters fast and immediately makes a break for victory. Heavens above, he's only gone and made it! There's no hesitation at all, just a beeline for glory. That really is a magnificent performance and a breathtaking time of merely four seconds. Four seconds? And he was so in the zone that he didn't even notice the treats. Surely Bella doesn't stand a chance. Contestant 2 enters and the arena door is closed behind her. Her first few steps look hopeful, but again she seems to be pausing and thinking. And this time, just five seconds in, her thoughtful approach has already cost her the round. Okay, I'm going to speed things up a bit. Over a minute later, Bella's made up her mind but heads down the wrong path. 
Once again, she takes her time, looking around and sniffing the cardboard. Maybe she's accepted defeat and so is simply enjoying the craftsmanship of this beautifully constructed stadium. Eventually, she turns around and takes the other wrong path, before stopping by the entrance and proceeding to take the first wrong path again. Oh, Bella. At this point, our interference didn't really matter, so I laid down a trail of treats to try and lead her to the finish line. With her time in tatters, can Bella follow the delicious snacks to the finish line? Evidently not. Hell's bells, she jumps! Contestant 2 has left the maze and is thereby disqualified. I repeat, Bella has been disqualified. You can't put her back in, she's been disqualified. This really is unprecedented. Bella's coach has re-entered her into the maze, defying all maze association rules. This really will cost them dearly at the judges' table. And even with the additional help, after a shocking time of 13 minutes, Bella failed to finish. This has been a most remarkable comeback for contestant 1, finishing in a time of 4 seconds, almost 200 times faster than contestant 2. Wow, what a round! I will surely be telling my grandchildren about this day! Everything comes down to Maze 3, and this time it's a lot more difficult. It'll probably be Christmas before Bella finishes. Oh, wait. This time the entrance is on the right, and after rounding a corner, there are four possible directions. Left to a dead end, right to a dead end, straight on to a dead end, or straight and right to victory. This single path then snakes round all the way to the finish line with no further obstacles. But will the cats be confident enough to follow it around several twists and turns? This time we're going to let Bella go first, and remember, it's currently a draw. This round is a decider, and this time the stakes are higher too. At the finish line, Bella has some pure chicken breast, and Ralph a whole tuna loin. I mean, they get their rewards either way, but let's just pretend the stakes are higher. Contestant 2 has entered the maze for the final time, and after last round's disqualification, she'll be looking to make up some ground. She pauses and sits down. Did she not learn anything from the previous round? It really makes you wonder just what on earth her coach said to her in the changing room team talk. After a solid 60 seconds, Bella goes right, but right's wrong. And just when I thought this whole debacle couldn't get any more controversial, Bella's coach appears to be guiding the way with her favourite toy. And she's encouraging her to bypass the long corridor and instead jump the internal walls. This contestant certainly has a history jumping walls, but will the jump this time be a legal one? Good lord! She's destroying the stadium! I don't know what to say! They don't prepare you for this in Commentator Academy! But what's this? A devilishly handsome chap in a blue shirt is leaning in and repairing the damage! My, what a good looking fellow! It was clear that Bella didn't stand a chance on her own, so Danielle kept trying to get her to jump the internal wall with the toy. You now rejoin me eight minutes into the final round, and Bella's somewhat awkward landing has landed her on the correct path. All she must do now is follow it round the corner to finally put us out of our misery. And she's going for it, chasing after the feathery toy with remarkable speed for such a chonker. She hesitates at the final corner. Can she see this through to the finish? Yes, she most definitely can. Bella has completed the maze in a time of eight and a half minutes precisely. And in all the excitement, I'd actually forgotten to put any treats in her bowl. By the time I filled it back up, she was back exploring the maze, probably wondering where her reward was. Now it was Ralph's turn, and eight and a half minutes was the time to beat. Contestant one is off and appears to have an advantage. He can quite literally smell the finish line. That tuna is some very potent stuff, and this fluffy boy is using his nose to guide the way, but it leads him straight into the first dead end. The feast is just the other side of the wall, and he can smell it so close and yet so very far. Now this was actually really interesting to watch. I know I've spent much of this video laughing at how silly my cats can be, but we were watching Ralph problem solve now, and logically tried to figure out how to get to that incredibly smelly tuna. He ventures further into the maze, still using that snout of his as a compass, but the needle is pointing decisively back to where he just was. It makes you question, will this in fact be an advantage or indeed his downfall? With just over a minute now elapsed on the clock, there is still everything to play for. But then, as if by some magical power granted by sheer will and determination, he turns, ignoring the dead ends and heading straight for glory. Ralph marches forward with such decisiveness that you have to wonder if his coach has slipped him a map. He pauses every few seconds to sniff the air, but this is looking exceptionally promising. He rounds the penultimate corner, making sure to smell everything, including the maze side camera, and turns onto the home straight. He can physically see the tuna now, and he's done it! Ralph has reached the finish line in an impressive 1 minute 48 seconds, far ahead of Bella's time and securing himself the round, the championship and eternal glory. This really has been one for the ages. There will be books written about this monumental day. So Ralph won. 
Here he is with his tiny little trophy. Admittedly, he had the enormous advantage of being able to smell the finish line. But believe it or not, Bella's actually allergic to fish, so we couldn't give her tuna too. Anyway, I'll see you all next year. Merry Christmas. Earlier this year, I built the world's greatest cat fort. But Ralph and I have since moved out of my parents' house, and he's been left decidedly castle-less. And though he's got a new friend, Bella, he's struggling to adapt to life without a luxury palace. He's been bugging me constantly to build him a new one. And so I'm finally giving in, but with some conditions. Number 1. The castle has got to be entirely made out of cardboard. Chateau de Ralph had a wooden frame, so it wasn't really a box fort at all, rather a wooden castle with cardboard cladding, and that really bugged me, so this time it's got to be entirely cardboard. And number two, it's got to be so big that I can use it as a human fort too, because who doesn't love box forts? So how do you go about building something of that size entirely out of cardboard? Well I found these cardboard bricks online that slot together, sort of like cardboard Lego, this isn't sponsored, I've had no contact or affiliation with the people who make them, but these bricks are perfect. Or nearly perfect. The trouble is, they come flat pack, and the go big or go home approach I was taking meant that I had 800 of them to assemble. 800! It took about 12 hours, and by the end of it, my hands were completely covered in paper cuts. But I didn't care about that, for it was only now that I truly realised the potential of these 800 chunks of cardboard. This is going to be the funnest day of my life. I got started right away, using the rug as an approximate footprint for the castle, although making sure the two towers that would be on either side protruded slightly, and leaving a gap for what would be the doorway. Thanks to the bricks just slotting together, I made incredibly quick progress, and before I knew it, the fort was already knee height. The doorway was a little more challenging. I had to build above first and then fill in the gaps from below to hold it all together and my plants were constantly getting in the way. Soon it got tall enough that I could only just climb over the walls. It was time to test out the doorway. I made it! Yes! Oh. <laughs> Already it was enormous, and I was only about halfway. It now occurred to me that I should probably include a window on either side. I made a small lip out of outward facing bricks, and doubled them up underneath. So sort of ruined the nice perfect brick pattern, but it's a really sturdy windowsill, and I've done the same on the other side. Before I could continue though, my project managers decided to check on my progress. Bella was first, and seemed less than impressed preferring to sit under the Christmas tree instead. Some trees tempted her inside, but only briefly. Ralph, however, was much more approving, gladly hoovering up the treats Bella had left behind. He sat down for a minute or two, inspecting my building work, before joining Bella back on the bed. And so I wasted no time getting to work on the rest of the castle. That's it, we've used up all the ordinary size bricks. It's looking pretty good. This is me stood on my tiptoes, so it's actually slightly taller than me. And then each tower, well they're quite a lot taller than me. Bloody hell, from the outside it's enormous. I can't even fit it all in one shot. That's huge! Obviously I know this is the size of my living room, but this is the first time I'm really getting that realisation. So after using up all the regular size bricks, next I use the single bricks to create battlements, that little square pattern often found at the top of castles. This is it, the very final brick. It's done. And then it was finished, structurally at least. In the morning, I decorate it with flags and banners and all that wonderful stuff, but for now I needed some sleep. 
I set up some motion sensor night vision cameras to see if either of the cats were brave enough to explore overnight. Ralph is first to enter, noticing one of the cameras straight away. Bella follows, although she doesn't enter the castle. The camera cuts out, but when it's triggered again, you can just make out her tail sneaking away to steal Ralph's food. A few minutes later, she returns and has a little sit, completely ignoring the castle once more, before disappearing back upstairs. Ralph, however, spends most of the night in the castle. He doesn't sleep, but spends the time bathing, scratching it, and wondering what on earth the cameras are over and over again. At one point, he even gets hyper and pounces on something. Just look at that butt wiggle. Here it is from the other angle. And then he's hyper, which is bad news for Bella, who's hungry again. On her way back, he pounces, and she retreats upstairs. And then soon I can be seen wiggling through the doorway in my pyjamas to turn off the cameras. So Ralph seems to like the castle, but Bella's completely disinterested. Maybe she'll warm to it if I make a flag with her face on. I made a banner for either side out of card, and cut out a paper Ralph and paper Bella to stick on each one, as well as their names in a medieval looking font. As for the castle's name, I asked for your suggestions on my community tab, and then put the most popular ones in a poll. The runner-up was Boxingham Palace, which I might have stolen from The Simpsons, and by far the winner, suggested by Arjun Armin, was the royal feline residence of Raphael and Isabella. Now that's a few too many paper letters for me to cut out, so I'm going to combine the two. I cut out Boxingham Palace in the same medieval font as the banners, but cheated and used stickers for the rest of it. All that was left was a few additions to the interior. I'd always wanted to put Ralph Shaylonge in his old castle, but it just wasn't big enough. Well, that was no longer a problem with this giant of a new one. I just had to try and squeeze it through the doorway. I added a silver platter as a food tray fit for royalty. And as a finishing touch, I added an art print, which is available at halfasleepchris.com. Yup, that's a not so subtle merch plug. I'm also selling coloring books, plectrums, temporary tattoos, and more. Go check it out. The link is in the description. But enough of that, it was time to formally open Boxingham Palace. May I cordially introduce you to Her Majesty, the Queen of Boxinghamshire. I was surprised to see that Bella absolutely loved the castle, probably because the Shaylonge was in there. And then His Majesty, the King of Boxinghamshire, decided to make an appearance too. He was once again inspecting the quality of my work, and judging by the way he rubbed his face on it, I'd say he was happy and he soon discovered how fun it could be to jump out the windows. Bella followed suit out of the other window, whilst Ralph jumped back in and had a bit more of an explore, before once again leaving through the window. I really needn't have bothered building a door. Bella eventually found the food and had a royal-sized feast, whilst Ralph posed regally as though he was getting his portrait taken. Now, I know what you're probably thinking. What if we ever come under attack from enemy cats who wish to claim Boxingham Palace as their own? Well, Bella's got that covered with her very own cardboard tank. On second thoughts, maybe don't attack us, please. But the one who enjoyed the castle most of all was undoubtedly me. I mean, I got to live out every child's dream and turn their living room into the ultimate box fort. And I guess the fact that the cats liked it too was just an added bonus. This video is sponsored by Pretty Litter. Right now, most of the world is stuck indoors. Bored, sleepy, and not really doing a lot. We've become house cats. So what if there was a project you could do to keep both yourself and your enormous fluff ball entertained? Really, I promise you there's a cat in there somewhere. He's not all just fluff. You see, I made my old cat Reggie fort Reggie, and then Tom had Tom's time machine. But Ralph's been feeling a little left out. Imagine if that's why he meows at me so much. This whole time he's just been asking me to build him a fort. Well now I finally am. All it took was a worldwide lockdown. So to make it up to him, I try and make it the greatest box fort in the history of cat kind. 
I'd need some cardboard boxes and a glue gun. Pause where I can see them, punk. Now I really did want to build this entirely out of cardboard. Ideally I'd have used those really thick cardboard tubes as uprights and supports, but because of the lockdown I just couldn't get hold of any. So instead, I'd have to cheat and build a wooden frame. I know, I'm disappointed in myself too, but I want it to last and be safe and sturdy for Ralph. So this was realistically my only option. So here's the plan. The castle will be about 1.6 meters tall, 1.2 meters wide, and about 45 centimeters deep. Inside there will be three half length alternating levels, plus a fourth longer top level where Ralph can stretch out and watch over his kingdom. There'll be a few windows dotted around, and of course it will have a fully functional drawbridge. The first task was to cut out the different levels. I marked them on a sheet of wood, including the protruding bit for the towers, and cut them out. This was a perfect visualisation of the castle's footprint, and my first real impression of its size. And already, my project manager was checking up on me. Since I couldn't buy any new wood because all the shops are closed, this whole castle would be a mismatch of leftovers from previous projects. Some of the uprights were from an old shoe rack I took apart, and others were offcuts from when I built these two units last year. And the main sheets of wood were from when I built my old guinea pigs a run a couple of years ago. Once everything was cut to the correct height, I added battens to the wall, screwed in the surface, and then secured the uprights. Ooh, the spirit level. I repeated everything to build the second level, but before I went any further, added a doorstop, because it was only a matter of time before I accidentally sent the whole thing crashing to the ground. And then I added the third level, again securing it to both the batten and uprights. Now I'm going to get Ralph and just check the heights and that he can easily climb between them. I bribed him up with treats, and yeah, so far so good. And then finally I cut out the top level, the slightly longer one which I'm hoping will become a favourite sleeping spot of his. This time I attached two battens to the wall, and used more pieces of the old shoe rack as uprights. All that was left were the towers, and this is where the lack of wood really became a problem. I only had two long uprights, extra side panels from when I built Reggie's bridge. Those two pieces would go on the inside of each tower, and at the edges I had to sort of bodge together some shorter pieces using shelf brackets. It's such a hodgepodge mess of shoddy carpentry. And once again, my project manager came in to assess my progress. He somehow failed to notice a massive cat castle, but immediately noticed the tiny doorstop I'd installed. So I put him on the top and bribed him with yet more treats. He left a lovely patch of cat dribble and had a bit of an explore, but decided he was content for now at ground level with some head scratches. So it's the next morning and it's only now really dawning on me that I'm going to have this massive cat castle in my room forever. The next job was to make a working drawbridge. Now as a cat owner, I know there's a very high probability that Ralph will never use this thing, so I want to make it as appealing to him as possible. Sometimes he sleeps on hard wooden surfaces, whilst other times he favours soft and squidgy things, such as cushions, beds or me. So I'd include a variety of different textures on the castle's levels, in the hope that he'd like at least one of them. The bottom level I'm going to leave just as wood. This one's going to be covered in fabric. This one's going to be covered in cardboard. And then the top I'm going to carpet. I got this really cool zigzag material free from a shop once, who were giving it away as an old furniture sample. I cut it roughly to size, and attached it using a staple gun. Well that was a plan at least. There was literally one staple in there, and I can't even go out and buy more. The lockdown strikes again. Instead, I used some tiny nails to hold it in place, and some glue to seal it under the edge. The next level up would be covered in cardboard, which I again glued in position, and then the top story would be carpeted, with the leftover piece of Ralph's favourite carpet. Now I know he likes this stuff, so he's got no excuse not to use it. I cut it to size and screwed it in place, again gluing it over the edge. Once again, Ralph came in to investigate, and after dribbling all over the freshly laid carpet, he had a bath on the fabric and a rest on the cardboard. Could it be that I'd actually made something he liked? And then finally, it was time to attach the cardboard. 
It was pretty boring actually, just a couple of hours measuring and cutting, and then doing it all again because I'd got it wrong the first time. I cut battlements into the top, this typical castle square pattern, and then these sort of church shaped windows. I deliberately made these off centre because there were internal wooden beams preventing them from being in the middle. I made sure they were symmetrical to one another at least, but I hated it. I guess I should have just made them central but smaller to begin with, but as a workaround, I cut out some window frames, which I spray painted gold and glued over the top. It fixed the problem and the gold accent looked kinda cool. I also made a portcullis out of popsicle sticks, you know that gate thing from the 1p coin, which I again painted gold and glued in position. To go with the whole recycled theme of this project, I tried making my own flag out of some leftover fabric and old clothing, but it turns out textiles is not one of my strengths. Instead, I settled on some decidedly easier to make bunting, and attached a real Union Jack to the top, the very same flag I took up the UK's tallest mountain in a previous video. The last thing to do was to name the castle, and I honestly had no idea what to call it, so I put it to you in a poll on the community tab. I really liked Forty Mook Fort Face, suggested by Jacob Saxby. The kingdom and land unified under one lord and the lands of the Holy Castle of Ralph, put forward by Shazam Pop. And my personal favourite, the brilliant Chateau Cateau from The Tim Traveller, one of my favourite YouTube channels. But ultimately Chateau de Ralph won, with a whopping two thirds of the vote. And to my complete disbelief, Ralph took an immediate interest in his new castle. An interest that lasted precisely four and a half seconds. Four and a half seconds. I spent four and a half days building this thing. So this is Chateau de Ralph, the most luxurious cat castle in all the land. And this is Ralph not using it. What do you have to say for yourself, Ralph? This is exactly what Reggie did with his bridge. I think there must be some kind of secret cat code they all adhere to, in order to frustrate and bewilder their humans as much as they can. So Ralph is sleeping on this carpet, and not this carpet where there are treats and which has been put there especially for him. Or maybe Ralph's just a lot cleverer than I thought. Maybe he knows that if he completely ignores it, then I'll go to the supermarket and I'll buy one of every type of cat treat they sell in order to bribe him. And then not only will he have his very own castle, but he'll have a bountiful feast to enjoy whilst up there. Whatever his motivations, it worked. Some of the time he thinks he's hiding and that I can't see him. Ralph, the tail's a bit of a giveaway. And other times I genuinely can't see him, until he suddenly pops out from one of the windows. There he is. <laughs> he likes to rub up against and scratch on the cardboard, so I'm sure this castle's gonna have a very limited lifespan. But at least he doesn't hate it. and I made sure he'll remember the forts that came before his. He's sleeping. I think that means he likes it. Now before you go, I want to show you something really cool. See these tiny orange dots in Pretty Litter's cat litter? They work in exactly the same way as litmus paper, indicating pH level. If your cat's urine is acidic, such as this lemon juice, the litter will turn a yellowy orange, indicating potential kidney problems. And if it's too alkaline, demonstrated here by bicarbonate of soda dissolved in water, the litter will turn a bluish green, which could be a sign of bladder issues or a urinary tract infection. Healthy urine or water will turn a sort of olive green. And if there's blood, which I'm demonstrating here with food coloring, the litter will turn red. Obviously only a vet can diagnose medical conditions, but this can prompt you to take your cat to see one, but look into things further. And cats are notorious for hiding symptoms, so early detection like this could save your cat's life. And it's not just wee wizardry. Pretty Litter isn't your ordinary kitty litter. It uses lightweight crystals to trap odour and release moisture, meaning that there's no smell. It's virtually dust free and incredibly lightweight, unlike normal, extremely heavy litter that's a pain to buy, transport and store. Just a single bag lasts an entire month. All you have to do is scoop out the poops and give it a stir every now and then. 
Visit prettylitter.com and use promo code HALFASLEEPCHRIS for 20% off your first order. That's prettylitter.com and promo code HALFASLEEPCHRIS for 20% off. Ralph and Tom, they're my favourite little pussycats. Ralph and Tom, they're my favourite little dudes. Ralph has very fluffy ears and Tom's a long cat. They hope you like their videos and subscribe to... This video is sponsored by Pretty Litter. Last month, I built Ralph the world's greatest cat fort. It's four stories tall, including his luxurious carpeted penthouse suite, and even has a working drawbridge. And after completely ignoring it initially, he's become really quite fond of his castle. But the high life has gone straight to his fluffy little head. Ralph thinks he's royalty, and admittedly, I guess I sort of treat him like royalty, waiting on him hand and paw. He has legions of adoring fans who send him literally hundreds of drawings and letters. And he's even started only eating gourmet cat food. I'm serious. A few weeks ago I ran out of his normal food and the expensive stuff was all the shop had left. And since tasting it, he flat out refuses to eat anything else. Thousands of years ago, the ancient Egyptians worshipped cats. And I guess his castle is a monument to just how little times have changed. And I've got to admit, Ralph is pretty adorable and undeniably regal. Ralph, I'm trying to show everyone how regal you are. Well, most of the time. So today, I want to set up an overly elaborate photo shoot to take his royal portrait. If you enjoy this video, please consider subscribing. It makes Ralph and me very happy. For inspiration, I look no further than the human royal family. After examining countless royal portraits, I made the following three observations. Number one, they usually sat on some kind of incredibly ornate chair or sofa. Number two, there's often this fancy damask pattern wallpaper. Sometimes it even matches the sofa. And number three, there's lots of gold. On the sofas, around the wallpaper, just lots of it. So whilst real gold is just a tiny bit outside my price range, I could probably get my hands on some gold paint at least, and the posh wallpaper shouldn't be too difficult to find either. The real challenge would be the sofa. Whilst there are companies that specialise in eccentric pet furniture, as you can imagine, they are insanely expensive. And if you've ever had a cat, you'll know just how stubborn they can be, rarely using the beds or toys you buy for them. So I couldn't really justify spending hundreds of pounds on a sofa Ralph would likely never use. Instead, I did the next best thing and bought a cardboard one. At least Ralph seemed to like it, but it wasn't exactly the look I was going for. I was back to square one. But then, after several weeks trawling the internet, Ralph found a second-hand cat-sized Chez Lange newly listed on eBay, which he eagerly snapped up for a very reasonable price. And 10 days later, it arrived. Good afternoon, I've got a package from Mr. Ralph. Now I should mention, it is broken. Two of the legs are very wobbly, and one has entirely fallen off. But I knew this when I bought it, and it's nothing I shouldn't be able to fix. I took the legs off, sanded them down, and spray painted them gold. I figured the easiest way to reattach them would be using some additional strips of wood, which I cut to size. By doing it this way, I could screw down into each leg and then screw up into the chelange itself. Finally, I touched up the paintwork where I'd been a little overzealous with the glue. Good as new. But as could only be expected, Ralph was far more interested in the box it came in. I don't know why I'm even surprised anymore. Next, it was time for the background. I endured the horrifically long queue at the hardware store, but managed to find everything I needed easily enough. I bought some wallpaper, some foam boards, these wood effect vinyl floor tiles, a skirting board, and some long strips of wood. I used the foam boards as a backdrop, attached together using the wood. It didn't really seem worth the effort of properly pasting the wallpaper, so instead I used double-sided sticky tape to hold it in place. I mean, it doesn't need to last or look good long term, so I should get away with it. And peeling all the tape was incredibly satisfying. I even impressed myself with how I managed to seamlessly line up each sheet. 
I really thought I was going to mess this up, so I'm delighted with how it looks. Next, I attach the fake wooden floorboards to more foam boards, cutting them to size where necessary. They were self-adhesive, which made the whole process super easy. And lastly, I cut the skirting board to size and painted it white, and once it had dried, used hot glue to attach it to the backdrop. As a finishing touch, I added a house plant in a pot which I yet again spray painted gold. How cool does this look? What always amazes me about the magic of photography is that this was just a hastily cobbled together set in my bedroom. But once you crop out the surroundings with the framing of the camera, you're transported to a luxurious cat-sized palace. It looked magnificent, and it was about to look even more so. What do you think, Ralph? He certainly seemed to like the backdrop. And then much to my surprise, well this happened. Ralph genuinely loved his Shay Lange. I didn't even need to bribe him with treats. It was everything I'd imagined. He looked glorious. You know how on school photo day, you have to take a boring serious photo, and then another where you get to pull a funny face? Well this is where the catnip came in, and out came the crazy. Ralph just seemed to love the camera, and I got tons of amazing royal portraits, as well as some that weren't quite as royal. <laughs> I put loads of pictures of Ralph up on Instagram, at Half Asleep Chris, so make sure to head over there if you want to see more of him. And it would absolutely make my day if you took a royal portrait of your own cat. Tag me on Instagram if you do, and I'll include the best ones in the next cat video. Since Ralph lives in a castle, and only eats the finest gourmet cat food, it's only fitting that he uses Pretty Litter, the greatest cat litter in all the land. Pretty Litter changes colour with the pH level of your cat's urine to indicate potential health concerns. Red obviously means there's blood, yellow means it's too acidic, which could indicate kidney issues, olive green is normal and healthy, and then blue means it's too alkaline, which could be a sign of bladder problems or a urinary tract infection. Whilst only a vet should diagnose health issues, it can prompt you to take your cat to see one, weeks or even months before they start displaying noticeable symptoms. And as well as this rainbow magic, Pretty Litter uses lightweight crystals similar to silica beads to trap odours and release moisture, meaning that there's no smell. It's virtually dust free and exceptionally lightweight, and they deliver straight to your door, which is incredibly useful in this age of lockdowns and long queues. One single bag lasts the entire month, simply scoop out your cat's royal poops and give it a stir. Visit prettylitter.com and use promo code HALFASLEEPCHRIS for 20% off your first order. That's prettylitter.com and promo code HALFASLEEPCHRIS for 20% off. Ralph and Tom, they're my favourite little pussy cats. Ralph and Tom, they're my favourite little dudes. Ralph is very fierce, Ralph is very fluffy is and Tom's a long cat. They hope you like their videos and subscribe to... I'm moving house. In fact, I'm recording this voiceover right now in my new office with Ralph sitting on the windowsill beside me. But before the big move, I had one lingering question. You see, last year I used a GPS tracking device to see where Ralph went at night. It turns out he's quite the adventurer, exploring much further than I'd ever imagined. But what exactly he got up to on these adventures remained a mystery. Whilst I knew where he went, I had no idea what he was doing there. Well, that would be my last chance to find out. Everyone in the comments suggested strapping a GoPro to Ralph to film his escapades, but well, I doubt Mrs. Pennyapple next door would appreciate Ralph filming her in private, and I very much doubt we'd want to see what that looks like. So I did the next best thing and followed him.
Straight away, there was an obvious flaw with this method. Ralph was the one following me, and each time I managed to subtly sneak away, he'd run straight over the moment he noticed. My being there was affecting his behaviour, but when I stayed close, he spent most of the time just sniffing various objects. In fact, he did a very thorough job of sniffing just about everything in the garden. Maybe that's what he does all night. His other apparent hobby was sitting at the gate and deciding whether or not to go out. After 20 minutes of indecision and several false starts, Ralph eventually slunk off into someone else's garden, and I was left behind, none the wiser. Now if you've been keeping up with my videos lately, you can probably guess where this is going. I recently filmed a family of foxes using a series of motion censored night vision cameras, and it was every bit as adorable as it sounds. So after several weeks sitting dormant in a box, the cameras were about to be put to use once more. The first was aimed at the cat flap, simply to keep tabs on Ralph's comings and goings throughout the night. The second was pointed at the back gate, the spot where Ralph likes to sit and think about whether he wants to go out or not. And the third was strapped to the travel signpost, with the field of view extending to the front door. Again for reasons of ethics and privacy, all three cameras were on my own property, without filming or intruding on anyone else's. It wouldn't give me a complete picture of Ralph's movements, but hopefully a sufficient overall portrait. With everything set up and good to go, we just had to wait for the lazy bones to wake up. I got tired of waiting and ordered a pizza, and then something inexplicably bizarre happened. The pizza guy appeared to be subduing some invisible enemy, or squeezing in some karate practice between deliveries. Whatever he was doing, he certainly appeared to be enjoying himself, and probably didn't realise he was being watched. But what the cameras were about to capture later that night was even more dumbfounding than a pizza delivering ninja. At first, there was nothing remarkable. Ralph left the cat flap just like every other night at about 8pm, and then did his usual trick of sitting by the gate making his mind up. It looks as though my presence didn't affect that particular behaviour, but then he vanished entirely, for hours. Seriously, Ralph was nowhere to be seen. And when he returned around midnight, the cameras kept just missing him. With the 0.3 second delay between triggering the motion sensor and the camera beginning to film, he'd always be just out of frame, a mere flash of fluff slinking beyond our vision. Except for one small detail. That's not Ralph. This is George, Ralph's orange counterpart. He's our neighbour's cat and used to be good friends with our old cat Reggie, but as far as I was aware didn't really interact with Ralph. So what is he doing loitering suspiciously in Ralph's garden? He was most definitely up to something, and it wasn't long before we found out what. Let me explain, this is a microchip cat flap that only lets Ralph in the house. By default it's locked, but when Ralph is within a certain proximity, the cat flap recognises his microchip and unlocks to let him in. And much to George's frustration, it means that he can't get inside, but that certainly wasn't going to stop him trying. He tried to enter over 10 times in the space of a single hour, despite knowing full well it wasn't going to open. So what exactly was making him so determined to get inside? Remember a few months back when all the panic buying was happening? Well this extended to cat food, and every supermarket's aisles were practically empty, all except for the unreasonably expensive gourmet cat food, which I reluctantly bought. So for the next month, Ralph was living the high life, and he evidently developed a taste for it, so much so that when we were once again able to buy his normal food, he'd point blank refuse to eat it. And so I gave in to his hunger strike, and now the little monkey gets gourmet food all the time. But what's any of that got to do with George? Well, whenever we leave a door or window open, he's straight in to steal Ralph's feast, and it appears he's also developed a taste for fine dining. If his determination is anything to go by, that cat food must be really good. George eventually gives up and wanders off in a strop, and that's when Ralph finally reappears and first notices the camera. Doesn't he look super creepy in the night vision? Ralph's very unsure what to make of it, so sits and watches the camera suspiciously for the next few minutes. That is until George realises he's back, and he knows precisely what that means. Food. Glorious food. 
Ralph is very literally the key to the cat flap, and as long as he's within a few centimetres, George can get in too. He pauses momentarily to make sure there's no click that would mean it's locked again, and once he's satisfied, delightedly climbs through to join in the feast. Ralph leaves three minutes later, and George follows a staggering 11 minutes afterwards. 11 whole minutes of eating like a king. I certainly didn't expect this when I set the cameras up. Once again, the two cats disappear for five hours until early morning. By now, someone's woken up and left fresh food out for Ralph, and it looks like George is hungry again. Soon Ralph returns to unlock the culinary wonders, and just like last time, is inside for a mere four minutes, whilst George stays in and eats for ten, licking his lips upon his exit. I really am shocked. He's got it all figured out and knows exactly how to get to the food. I left the cameras on for two more nights, and they captured the exact same thing over and over. George repeatedly trying the cat flap, and often waiting in position until Ralph returned, then the pair going inside together. Ralph would always leave first, followed by George a good few minutes afterwards, usually licking his lips after a lavish banquet of stolen food. On one of the mornings, the camera caught them briefly playing together under the gate, but this was the first and only sign of any sort of relationship the two cats might have had. Whilst Ralph was looking for friendship, George was in it for the food. Though the filming didn't shed any light on what Ralph got up to on his great adventures, it most certainly revealed a secret part of his life that I never knew existed. And like I said, it really showed me that now, some seven months after losing his brother, Ralph was in need of a friend. So as we said goodbye to my parents' house and to this chapter in our lives, a friend is exactly what Ralph would be getting. But that's a story for another video. If you can't wait until then, go follow me on Instagram for an exclusive sneak peek. And over on Instagram, Ralph has hundreds of friends from all over the world, and you sent in some truly marvellous royal portraits. There were so many amazing choices, but my top 10 in no particular order have got to be the adorable socks in her wonderful Viking ship, Richie, who clearly wants to become the new face of Andrex, Daxter looking dapper in his green spotty bow tie, Jurgen in his homemade four poster bed, Dolly sleeping in her tiny little crown, Tilly and Jasmine cuddled up together, Little Bear also looking elegant in his crown, the incredibly fluffy Yeti looking majestic in front of the fire, Ivy looking gorgeous for her portrait, and finally Garbo who isn't even a cat but looks glorious nonetheless. Thanks to everyone who sent a picture in, it's been wonderful seeing all your creativity and how cute your cats are, and feel free to continue tagging me with more. Ralph and Tom, they're my favourite little pussy cats. Ralph and Tom, they're my favourite little dudes. Ralph has very fluffy ears and Tom's a long cat. They hope you like their videos and subscribe to. Wake up, sleepyhead, it's moving day. Today was the big day. Ralph and I were moving out of my parents' house and into our own, along with my girlfriend Danielle and her cat Bella. After losing his brother Tom at the end of the year, Ralph was clearly yearning for a friend, but Bella, maybe not so much. You may remember her from the fox video where she very casually sent a family of foxes running for the hills. She's 11, and Danielle's had her since she was just a tiny little kitten. Bella even had kittens herself when she was two, none of which looked anything like her. But they all found new homes and she's since been spayed, and ever since, Bella's been living as the only cat in the household, so she's in for a bit of a shock when she meets Ralph. Ralph meowed every two or three seconds for the whole journey. It's okay buddy. And then he meowed some more when I let him out again. For the first few days, he'd be confined to just one room. He'd likely be very overwhelmed by completely new everything. Okay. 
so the idea was to get him used to his own little safe space first, before then introducing him to the rest of the house, and then Bella. All that meowing and he's tired himself out. She was next door in her own room. And as predicted, both cats were pretty daunted by everything. And I guess we were too. This whole moving house thing was a pretty big deal. To just uproot yourself like a carrot and plant yourself into an entirely new vegetable. patch. It was pretty overwhelming. I'm not normally a frivolous person, but there was so much stuff we needed to buy. And most of it wasn't even exciting stuff. Just things like doormats, bins, plates and bowls, all those delightfully boring things. And then there were the bills. Electricity, water, gas, internet, regular cat food, gourmet cat food. But after a few days, everything settled down. And so did Ralph and Bella. They were both fully relaxed and accustomed to their rooms. So it was finally time for them to meet. The idea was to introduce them to a new space at the same time, a room neither cat was familiar with or believed to be their territory. We also installed a pet gate to enable them to see each other face to face without the risk of attacking each other. So Bella's going in the dining room with Danielle and I'm going to put the gate across and go and get Ralph. Ralph. Hey buddy. It's time to go and meet Bella. Now it's perfectly normal and expected for new cats to hiss at one another. They sort of need to get all the look how tough I am stuff out the way before any friendship can begin. It was actually the first time I've ever seen Ralph hiss. And it's amazing how evil it makes their faces look. But then Ralph and Bella seem to settle down, trying to hide from one another. Danielle got Bella playing with a toy, whilst Ralph just sat there grumpily. So I tried another tactic, the key to Ralph's heart, treats. Eventually Ralph started playing with his favourite toy, in fact the only toy he's ever really played with, a catnip filled pillow which someone very kindly sent him. But both cats seemed thoroughly disinterested in each other. And that's the way it continued for the next week. A few times a day, we'd get each cat in the room with the pet gate, and slowly they became more curious, staring at each other from a safe distance. And then for basically a month, nothing happened. We let both cats have the run of the whole house together, and were only separated when we went out. But frustratingly, they managed to consciously avoid each other this entire time. Seriously, they hardly ever came into contact. Fast forward another few weeks to now, and they're slowly getting used to each other. They started feeling comfortable enough to sleep in the same room together, which was an enormous step. And then this happened. And since then, Bella's obviously realised that Ralph doesn't want to eat her or anything, because they've even started sleeping on the same bed. Isn't that adorable? I mean, Ralph really wants to be friends, and Bella's still not entirely convinced yet, but this is looking incredibly promising. There is the occasional spat every now and then, but it's usually just Ralph spooking Bella and trying to get her to play. She's having none of it, but he can be pretty persistent. It's not all Ralph though. Sometimes Bella starts to play and they chase each other all over the house. Ralph's a bit quicker than Bella and she tends to sort of give up halfway, but it's really wonderful to see.
and that's where we're at now. Ralph and Bella aren't exactly friends by any stretch of the imagination, but they do play together and tolerate each other enough to sleep on the same bed. And that's a really fantastic start. Now before I wrap this video up, I've been inundated with comments and messages asking what will happen to Chateau de Ralph now that I've moved out. Well, I'm leaving it behind because it's got a new resident. Meet Coco, my parents' new kitten. She's 12 weeks old and was rescued by the same charity who rescued Ralph and Tom. She's friendly and cuddly and curious and playful, and just a wonderful bundle of joy and happiness with an incredibly loud purr. She's got mighty big boots to fill, but I'm sure she'll keep my parents on their toes now that Ralph and I have left. Plus, George will be delighted to have a new friend to share food with. I guess I'll just have to build Ralph and Bella a new fort, or perhaps an entire city. So it's finally time to announce the winners of last week's giveaway. Well done to everyone who correctly spotted the golden bear in front of the penguins. I know this curious penguin certainly noticed him. The 10 randomly generated winners are Sarah Celine Sandham, Ben Jackson, Moosey, Lee S, D. Proven, Eddie Evans, Ryan King, Jack Fletcher, Uzair Farouk, and Eric. Congratulations to everyone who won. Please email info at changechecker.org to claim your coin. And a massive thank you to Change Checker for setting this up and providing the prizes. This is a very crudely made stethoscope microphone, and this is my favourite sound in the world.
Meet Ralph. And as well as purring a lot, he also meows a lot. And I mean all the time. OK, I think you get the picture. From the moment we adopted him, he'd let out these tiny little meows, even on that first journey home. He meows when he wakes up. Good morning, sleepyhead. He meows when he's hungry. And then he meows when he's no longer hungry. I could list reasons all day, but just know that in any given circumstance, he's probably meowing. Sometimes I pretend we're having conversations. Well, technically we are having conversations. I just like to make up his replies. Hey Ralph, what's up? Uh, not much, just YouTube stuff. I'm filming a video right now, actually. Yeah, sure, anything you like, go ahead. That's great advice, Ralph. But then in December, his brother Tom died. I was distraught. And Ralph was even more so. For the entirety of their lives they'd been together, from when they were abandoned, rescued and adopted, to all the adventures they'd had in the year since. They were inseparable. They could always be found sleeping together, or playing together, or just up to some sort of general mischief together. They were Ralph and Tom, but now it was just Ralph. I don't know if Ralph really understood what had happened, but his meows turned into these long heartbreaking cries, as if he was asking where his brother was. And soon I became aware of something. I was now his best friend. And now he wanted to sleep with me, and play with me, and get up to all of that general mischief with me. And you guessed it, the meows got even more frequent. Which gave me a very strange idea. Allow me to explain, and bear with me on this one. When you play a piano, a real acoustic piano, you press a key, connected to a hammer, which strikes a string to produce a sound. And if you press the key really aggressively, the hammer hits the string harder and produces a louder sound, and the same if you hit it really lightly. However, when you play an electric keyboard, no sound is physically produced. Rather, by pressing a key, you trigger an audio recording of a real piano. So someone has sat at a piano and recorded every single key one by one. And not just once. They play each key at over a hundred different velocities, ranging from very softly to very aggressively, so that the keyboard responds depending on how hard you play. Another example is that horrible vocal preset most keyboards seem to have. You know, the one that sounds like this. Again, someone somewhere has stood in a recording studio and literally recorded themselves going <laughs> 
and mapped it to a keyboard in order to turn their voice into a playable instrument. It's just me in a fake moustache. Well, what if instead of that someone somewhere, I use... Used Ralph. I'd need a portable recorder, a bag of cat treats, or let's say two for good measure, and one very talkative cat. But in true cat fashion, Ralph just wouldn't meow, not even once. I don't know if it was just a typical stubborn cat mentality. or maybe he simply didn't like the recorder being shoved in his face, but either way he was giving me the silent treatment. I tried sparking a conversation, hey Ralph, crazy weather at the moment, but he wasn't in the mood for small talk, and even the treats didn't work, I just got whacked in the face by a giant fluffy tail. However, there was one other way. You see, 